may be seated uh, in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. As Tony just plays softly, it just um, that'll that'll remind me to be long, not to be long. Uh, I have a Bible. Yeah. 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 It's it's like a trip because when I took it off my shelf, um, I'm like, man, I ain't looked at one of these in in a long time, and um, then I open it up. And I couldn't see it. Yeah, and it, re- it reminded me of why I use an iPad. <laughs> yeah. So, so iPad is a backup today in case I can't see it. You know, um, I, I, everybody's saying put on glasses. No, I can't do that. Yeah, no, 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 no. I was in Africa, and you guys probably will not know this, but um, we landed in Ethiopia and I asked the team that was with me to look around, what do you see? And I said, notice with me that nobody in Ethiopia wears glasses. So you'd never, yeah, exactly. That's called real organic lifestyle. Yeah. And then we went to um, Malawi, and the same thing. Um, you don't see people walk around with glasses in Malawi. It's a trip. 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 So I concluded I must be either Ethiopian or Malawian, you know, <laughs> you know, so, but I wanted to use this today because um, what God is saying to me, um, I believe it's for, I prayed about this, someone in this congregation, let me just put it to you this way, or maybe for all of us, um, I don't know um, who the message is for, but I just can't shake this from my spirit. Uh, ever since we finished uh, Wednesday to pass the series on going out and serving, and we're going to be talking more about what we're going to do as a result of that. But this word been in my heart, and I just want to share uh, some principles with you from that passage of Scripture. So go with me in the book of Matthew. To the book. Whoa, look at me. I should put my glasses on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Matthew chapter 6. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Yeah, Matthew chapter 6. And we won't be long. So worship team, stay stand by. Um, and I'm going to invite you to come Wednesday to talk about this. Matthew chapter 6. And look with me at verse um, 9. And then we'll talk through this. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Well, go back to verse, go up to verse. What verse is that? Um, five. Verse five, let me start reading from verse five. Say amen if you're at verse five. Amen. It says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you that, you have re- that they have received their reward. reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. And when you pray, he says, do not heap up empty uh, phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your father who knows that what you have need before you ask him. Pray then like this, it says, and we just did this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, That phrase that we quoted is not in this part. might have been an addition. But look at what verse uh, 14 says. For if you forgive others their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespass, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Now back up to verse 12. And forgive us our debts or trespasses or sins as we also have forgiven others. Listen to what the Amplified Bible says. The Amplified Bible says... And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven, um, then it has in parentheses, left, remitted, 
let go the debts and given up resentment against others um, or our debtors. Verse 14 says, if we forgive people their trespass, that is, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if we do not forgive others of their trespass, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving them up their resentment, neither will your Father forgive you your trespass. I want to talk briefly about what I'm going to refer to um, as a very, 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 very dangerous invitation. That's what I'm going to talk about. This issue or this concept of forgiveness, it's um, something that, that as humans we wrestle with, with. It's something that plagues us, something that it's just extremely difficult for us to do in the true sense of the word is to forgive others and to release others of the wrong that they have done towards us. And one of the things I'm going to hit really, really quick, and the problem with forgiveness is that um, we say to people this when we try to be spiritual about the concept of forgiveness. Uh, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget what you did. Come on, y'all. I mean, and, and then what we do is, is even though we claim we have forgiven, we still walk around yeah, thinking about it, avoiding people, and protecting ourselves so they could never, ever wrong us again. And the question I want to ask this morning is that true forgiveness. Because I'm learning more and more that the word forgive or to offer forgiveness carries with it this subtle nuance where it requires action to substantiate its validity. Let me tell you what I mean by that. It's no different than love. Love's an intransitive verb. So I can say to my wife, baby, I love you. But if all I do is say I love you and I never demonstrate my love towards her, my love, it's just words being spoken. Come on, say amen. I want to lay out this morning that Forgiveness is no different than that. If I say I forgive you, but in all my actions, I avoid you, I don't talk to you, I don't interact with you, I don't give you access to me anymore, is that really forgiveness? Come on, y'all. Married couples wrestle with this a lot because in a relationship, the husband might do something crazy and then ask the wife to forgive him, and then all of a sudden, for the duration of the marriage, he ends up living his life under a microscope. And I always ask, is that true forgiveness? Is that forgiveness in the real sense of the word, or is it just spoken and not said? Okay. So let me read something to you. I want to read to you the definition of the word forgive that's used in this passage here. here. Here's what forgiveness means. It means to remove the guilt that results from the wrongdoing, to pardon, to forgive, and it means to, for, uh, in Matthew we saw it said, forgive us of our wrong. So listen to this carefully. It is extremely important to note that the focus in the meaning of forgiveness is upon the Removal of the guilt from the wrongdoer, not necessarily the wrongdoing itself. Does that, does that make sense? So, so, so in other words, um, the wrongdoing still exists, but when we forgive, the guilt associated with the wrongdoing should be forgiven, right? So, so let, me, let me tell you what that means. If I lied on you and you forgive me for lying, what you've done is you've released me from carrying the guilt of lying, but the fact is I still lied. Come on, y'all. 
and that lie could be perpetuating the wrongdoing still exists, but in forgiveness, we've been released from the guilt of it. Come on, does this make sense? I want us to really wrestle with that because let me throw God in the equation and let me talk about some things really quick. The interesting thing about God and Him forgiving us of sin, and I'm not going to be long, I just want to paint this, is He releases us from the guilt, and when we are released from the guilt, here's what it does for us. It, it lets us not feel so heavy or guilty, and we can still approach God. But now here's God. Even though the wrongdoing that we did still exists, He loves us in spite of. Now, I want you to hear me say, that is very, very different from human forgiveness. Here is how human forgiveness works. I release you from the guilt, but I protect myself, and I still hold you accountable for the wrongdoing. Let me go here. I thank God that on Calvary, he paid the price for all the wrongdoing I'm ever going to do, such that when he forgives me of my sin, he erases the wrongdoing from his mind. And watch this. Here's the effect of that. It allows me to have a restored relationship with him because he's not holding what I did against me. I know you are real quiet. But I don't know that we understand this concept of forgiveness. And I want you to see how important it is to the heart of God. So here's what verse 15 says. Look at verse 15 and then we're going to talk about this. It says this, If we forgive others of their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you their trespasses. So let me, I want, listen to this carefully, guys. I want you to hear me say this. Our forgiveness of our fellow man and God's forgiveness of us cannot be separated. They are interlocked. And they are interdependent. So here's what that means. If I have not put things right with my fellow man, I should not fool myself into thinking that I'm cool with God. Let that wrestle. I'm almost there. We quote this prayer a lot. Lord, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we pray for provision. Give us this day our daily bread. And we, of our own free will, quote verse 12. And forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And we pay no attention to the danger in what we're inviting God to do. We pay no attention to the danger of what we're inviting God to do. So we come every Sunday to worship. We come, we live our life, we go to work, we, we do what we do. And I wonder sometimes if the believer of God ever understands the importance of the mandate from God that we act like him, that we behave like him, that we conduct ourselves at him, that when the world see us, they see God in us. And I think what this text is trying to get us to understand is that when we pray that prayer, or when we say that prayer, if our hearts are not right, we are positioning ourselves for God not to relieve us of the debt that we have incurred against him. Let me say it this way. John chapter 4 verse 20 says, um, um, How can we say we love God whom we have not seen if we hate our brother whom we've seen every day. Now, somebody's going to say, I don't hate people. 
I don't hate my brother. I don't whatever. I'm going to say it to, to you this way. If, they had do, if they've done wrong to you and, and, and you walk around reminiscing on what they did to you and you protect yourself from them, you're treating them like an enemy. We saw we're in 9-11. The reason we commemorate 9-11 every year and the reason it's such a big day deal in the U.S. is so we can remind ourselves not to let our guards down. To protect ourselves from our enemy. My concern for God's church is we have a bunch of Christians walking around as if planes has hit the towers of our lives. And every day we have a memorial service (laughs) reminding ourselves of the wrong that somebody did to us. Family members that name the name of Christ can't come together. Christians that worship together can't come together. People living in community can't come together, but we call ourselves Christians. I want you to hear me say, God has a problem with that. And this morning, God wants us to begin the process of not being a community of believers or a group of people that live life like that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because of our own volition, we are impacting our own relationship with God. Please hear me say that. We are impacting our own relationship with God. Does that make sense? Let me say a couple of things because we don't have time to go to all these scriptures. We're going to really flesh this out on Wednesday. When God forgives you, The text says in Psalms, I think it's 103, he blots out our sin as far into the sea of forgetfulness, as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered no more. So here's what this looked like. When we go to heaven, um, there's not going to be a replaying of all the sins that we've committed because the blood of Jesus covers that. My concern after I really process the scripture in front of us, is that I'm going to say this and then we'll work it out Wednesday. If I cannot properly release, I am impacting my very salvation at its core. My relationship with God. Do I really have a relationship with him if I can't behave like him? Come on, does this make sense? I want, I want you to hear me. So let me read a couple of things about God's forgiveness and we're going to go to a text and I'm going to wrap this up. When God forgives us, Father, forgive me for our sin. Here's what doesn't happen. He doesn't say, let me pray about it. But yeah, thank goodness. He doesn't say, well, let me tell you how bad you hurt me. He doesn't tell you, well, let me tell you what you really did. And I like this. He doesn't say, you know, you did the same thing yesterday. And he doesn't say it's been 20 times since you've been doing the same thing. The moment, 1 John 1 and 9, I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to do what? forgives me, and then I love the next phrase because it says, and he cleanses me from all unrighteousness. So he says, come on, let's do it one more again. Man, I thank God that he's like that. I do. I really, really do. I really, really do. My growth now is to be like him. So he forgives fully. Number two, he forgives us immediately. Number two, he forgives fully and heartedly. So when I go to prayer, even if there might be signs that I might mess up again, here's what God doesn't say. I've been watching you. (laughs) 
He trusts me fully. Man, that's, that's, oh gosh. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on. Ah. Because if there's one somebody, like they say, up in here, up in here, up in here, who don't deserve to be trusted by God, it's me. Y'all best clap, pretending like you've been all that. Your hand ought to be up as well, like me. Are you with me? If there's one person, but, but here's the thing. I, I mess up, and I go to him, and I say, Lord, forgive me. And he says, come on, boy, I got you. And he forgives me, and then he gives me full access, total access. I mean, the bedroom, the living room, come on, the holy of holies. I'm a son all over again. And then he tells me, when you forgive, you got to do it like that. Or else, don't ask me to forgive you no more. Man. That is hard. That's the challenge. He forgives and he forgets and he cleanses from all unrighteousness. Go to Matthew. Let me show you this and then. I want to do some Matthew 18. Go to Matthew 18. Um, stop in at Matthew 15 on your way to 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cute, wasn't it? Stop in on 15. That's because I got a Bible and I got to pass 15 to get to 18. I like this. I use this more often. And jump down to 23. Yeah. Let me see if it's, I'll make sure I get, no, 5, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 23. I'm in the wrong place. Go to 5, 23. Listen to this, listen to this, yeah, 5, 23. Uh, let me show you this real quick. Um, and then we're going to go over to 18, okay? And then we'll, we'll pray. Um, you guys there? Um. I hate doing this, but go to 21. <laughs> I really do. Because I can see 21 and it's good, and you want to you get 21 in there. Yeah, you guys are there? Here's what 21 said. You have heard that it was said to these of hold, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Man. Don't miss that too, judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, Raka or you fool, will be liable to hellfire. So look at 23. So, because of those things, I can't even read 23. Y'all don't read 23. Don't read it yet. Don't read it. Don't miss what I just said. It says don't murder. If you murder somebody, you're going to be liable to judgment. And it says don't be angry with your brother. So don't act like angry just means fighting. Don't hold a grudge. Don't hold nothing. Release them. What's up? Because if you don't do that, you're going to be liable to counsel. And don't call nobody a fool because you might end up in hell. So because of that, verse 23 says, If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and then go first be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Y'all been hearing that. You don't know what that means. Let me help y'all. with Are you in E flat? Every praise to our God. Every word of worship on one accord. Every praise, every, hold up, hold, hold that right there, hold up, hold up. Girl, I've been gossiping about you, so I need you to release me so I can continue singing that song because God ain't hearing me right now, all right? And I make that right, and I can go back. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah. Dang, there's one more. Stop, 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 stop. Man. Pam, I really don't like you. I, 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 I you know, please forgive me. Um, I really didn't mean to, to, you know what I mean? 
We good? All right, cool. All right. God, my Savior, here's what we do. We haven't purified ourselves from the foolishness that we've done with our brother or sister. And we have the nerve to come in the presence of God and talk about we're giving him glory, we're giving him praise, we're exalting him. When just that morning on Facebook, are you with me? Our hearts hasn't been clear. Our hearts hasn't been pure. We haven't released others, but we want God to release us. What I'm laying out before you is we are extending a dangerous invitation to the Lord to say, close your ears to my prayers because my own heart isn't right. Listen to this. Forgive me the same way I have forgiven others. So here's what I did, God. I told them I released them, but I tell you what, I'm going to remember that. So here's what I need you to do. Forgive me, but I need you to remember what I did because I set the pattern for you. Okay? Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. So God, here's what happened. Man, that person stole from me, so I told them they're never going to steal from me again. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to never give them another dime. So here's what I need you to do. I'm never going to steal from you again. I'm going to start tithing, but I want you to nullify the blessing of my tithe by never giving me another dime. You're not hearing this because I want you to treat me like I treat them. I wish I had one person in here. Maybe the message is just for me so I can get it right. <laughs> Forgive us our debt. As we forgive our debtors, we're messing ourselves up. Now go over to 18. Let me hit this and then we'll, come on, worship team. Let's read 18. Yeah. Yeah. Start with me at verse 15. Ah, oh, bless your name, Lord. You guys doing all right? If you're at 15, say amen. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every char cha charge may be established in, by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the ch even the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. You've been released to worship. Man, I can hear that. Truly I say to you, whoever, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed. What? Here's a parenthetic. We quote that scripture all the time in the vein of the prosperity gospel. This is written in the context of the forgiveness of sins. So how I conduct myself in releasing others is what I'm asking heaven to do towards me. So if I bind up my own blessings by not releasing, I'm telling heaven, bind it up too. <laughs> if I release my blessings and my forgiveness by not holding you against what you did, then I'm releasing heaven to release me. I wish I had somebody in here because I'm acting according to the principles of God. So now notice this. Then he says here, where two or three gathered in my name day, I'm in the midst. Now, this was troubling to Peter. This was troubling to Peter. And I know Peter's here this morning because Peter came to him and said to him, Lord, okay, you're tripping. How many times... How often will my brother sin against me? And, he says, I have to forgive him. I'm going to give him three chances. That's what Peter said, right? Three times, Lord. One for the father, one for the son. <laughs> 
one for the Holy Spirit, then we good, right? Here's what Jesus said. But I say not seven times, but 70, what? Times seven times. He's Peter, I'm going to give him seven chances. He says 70 times seven. And notice what he says here. And, and it's a metaphor for unlimited amount of time. Let me just say this and we're going to stop. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I wish I had time to tell you what that really um, means in English as it relates to the numbers that's associated with 10,000 talents. Um, here's what some of the best commentators have said. Like the kids would say, that's a gazillion billion dollars. <laughs> you never pay that. You kind of get what I'm saying? And so here's what he did. When he be, um, began to settle the town, one who owed him 10,000, verse 25, and since he could not pay, which is my story, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payments be made. So the servant fell to his knees imploring him, have mercy with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, come on, say out of pity. The master of the servant released him and forgave him his debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's a day's wage. Come on. And seizing him, he began to choke him. Come on, saying to him, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience and I will pay you. But he refused and he went and he put the mind in prison until he should pay the debt. Isn't that what we do? Put people where? In, yeah, y'all get it. Y'all get it. Yeah, y'all get it. Y'all get it. Yeah, yeah. Verse 31. When his fellow servants saw that what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and went in and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then the master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that... Um, all what? Yeah. You wicked servants, I forgave you all that debt. I'm slowing down because I want you to see what the next phrase says. Why did I forgive you the debt? Anybody with an ESV? Yeah. All you did was ask me. Yeah, I missed that. All you did was ask me. That's all you did. A gazillion billion dollars. And I said, it's cool. Because you asked me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you? Let me tell you what that means. All they need to do is ask you. They shouldn't have to do They shouldn't even have to change their behaviors. They don't even have to stop. All they have to do is ask you. And you should be like me and just say, it's cool. But Lord, they're going to keep doing it. Well, you are 98 right now? You got a gazillion million more to go. It's been 500 times. Well, go 501. Because that's what I do for you. Come on, y'all. Don't act like you've only sinned seven times and you've stopped sinning. Stop it. Are you with me? Don't act like you've stopped ten times and you've stopped sinning. Don't act like you've sinned 70 times and you've stopped sinning. Come on. Quit lying to yourself by virtue of the fact that we deceive ourselves into thinking we're so holy. It's a sin in and of itself and we need forgiveness. So there go a million and twenty. And all we do is ask him. And he says, it's cool. <laughs> wow. So then he noticed what he says. In anger, he said, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay all the debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brothers from your heart. Let me read that again. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brothers. How? 
Not your lips. From where? Not your lips. From where? Now, so also the master will do. So listen to this. Do the exegetical work on the text. We imprison those who don't forgive us in the memory of our mind. When we refuse to forgive others, we cause a forgiving God who forgets our sin, we force him to remember what we did by causing him to imprison us in the memory of his mind. This is some stuff. Can y'all put, um, I have some things I want to read. The next one, um, next one right here. The magnitude of forgiveness we receive from God should be the basis for the magnitude of forgiveness we gave others, right? If you know what you used to do, that's all you need to know. <laughs> okay, and what God forgave us from, that's how free we ought to be. I am disqualified from talking about anybody. And I think you are too. So stop having the conversations. Next one. Go to number two. Um, when we refuse to forgive those who seek our forgiveness, we subconsciously imprison them in the prison of our own what? Minds, not theirs. True story. I got more folk that talk about me that I don't think about. <laughs> Come on, y'all. You got the same thing. You got folk talking about you. You ain't even thinking about them. Because they have you imprisoned in their minds, not yours. <laughs> right? Let it go. Next one. Our unwillingness to forgive is not restricted between us and the individual we refuse to, re to forgive. It is observed by and it impacts the entire community we are a part of. Let me help you understand what that means. I am willing to bet that if you have problems with somebody in here, you're not the only one who know about it. <laughs> I'm willing to bet. When the community saw it, they went and told the master, you have spoken to somebody else. Because you want them to imprison that person just like you got them in. Let's share jail cells. <laughs> and that's the meeting we were talking about. Meeting after the meeting, right? Because we can't let go. Next one. God refers to us as wicked. Watch this. Not because we are debtors to others, but he calls us wicked when we refuse to forgive others with the magnitude of forgiveness you receive from him. Man, that's heavy. Last one real quick, then I'm sharing my big idea. Our refusal to forgive others extends a very dangerous invitation to God, permitting him not to forgive us of our wrong, which carries grave consequences as it relates to our salvation. Hard to get into heaven if God remembers the wrong that you did. hard to get into heaven. You don't want to get to Calvary or to heaven and as opposed to the blood coming down the screen, it stops. God said, you didn't release Sally, so I had to keep that there. And that impacts relationship. So here's my big idea inductively. Our appreciation of God's forgiveness should always be reflected in our ability to consistently, consistently, consistently forgive others. I normally leave my home at about shortly after 5 in the morning and go through my pregame routine. So I leaned over to my wife and I kissed her while she was still asleep, blowing in her ear and I can't tell y'all what else I did. And she rolled over. What's wrong with you this morning? I got to talk about forgiveness. I got to make sure it's right. <laughs> That's how it works. So she said, 
Let's see if this lasts till after church. <laughs> consistently. Consistently. Ephesians 4 says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There's one Lord, one faith, one God, one Father who is in all and through all. We ought to be such a loving community of people. Not saying that people won't wrong us, but we got to be able to forgive and release and to love again. And a lot of us can't love again because of the walls that we've set up. And the only reason those walls continue to exist is because God is not able to take it down, not because of his ability, but because of us. And it has nothing to do with the other person and everything to do with us. Open those prison doors and let them out. Let them out. And ask God to help. 